Andrew, thank you so much indeed for your time. Listen, I'll ask you about your experience as Chief of Police in a moment, but let's go with the most current uh, situation as it is. What have you made of the policing of these nationwide demonstrations? Well, I'm, I'm a little disappointed with regards to the manner in which policing has occurred. There's been, unfortunately, too much mayhem allowed to occur. And what's happened is the peaceful protests are being joined with those other groups of individuals that want to agitate, create violence, and then obviously get involved in the looting and what have you. The peaceful demonstrators are trying to establish a message, and that message is being obscured by the violence. I'm seeing from my review of the news and what's in the papers, the police seem to be holding back from their response to protect the property and some of the lives that are occurring throughout the country. I'm a little disappointed in uh, the police response relative to, they have too much hands off relative to the, the violent demonstrators. Have you seen uh, any of the videos of the police uh, pushing and uh, reacting against demonstrators who are clearly peaceful, some of whom are literally just standing still, others who are even on the ground with their hands in the air, and then the pictures, and there's so many of them, video of police officers firing tear gas or whatever else they might be firing. I'm not even sure if I can say that I'm convinced they're rubber bullets because I haven't seen the details of those incidents, but of attacking journalists and the media who are covering the demonstrations, because that is very, very bizarre. With regards to the actions of the police, clearly there are going to be some officers that are going to engage in behavior, considering the nature of the event, that are going to act inappropriately. Particularly, there was a, a picture of a New York police officer pushing his police cruiser through a barricade that, was, that the car was surrounded and obviously knocked over some protesters. The issue of, uh, of uh, rubber bullets, there have been no reports that I am aware of of any mass types of deaths or bullet wound injuries as a result of these, um, the police response. Clearly, any officer that loses their cool under these circumstances, particularly when somebody is nonviolent, non-threatening, any excessive force is unwarranted. You do have to understand, though, that it's a very, very energized, very complex situation on the streets, and it's very fluid. And we refer to it as being very dynamic, and what could be peaceful at one time can rapidly move to violence. And that's what these officers are attempting to balance between protecting themselves, the public, and obviously allowing the peaceful protesters to do what's allowed under the United States Constitution, and that's protest. Uh, Andrew, do you agree with the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, who says there is no systemic racism in police forces across the U.S.? Based on my 40 years of law enforcement experience, I can honestly say that there is not a systemic racist problem but there is racism within the ranks of law enforcement. Is it systemic? Absolutely not. Is it relative and does it persist within law enforcement agencies? Yes, it does. It's unfortunate that some actions of those officers that exhibit racist behavior wound up tainting the majority of police officers who just want peace and they, they will apply the law equally to anybody of any ethnicity. That's what makes this country so great, is that tolerance and that understanding. Unfortunately, we're getting the situation here where all of the law enforcement officers are being tainted with the, with the moniker of racism when that's not entirely the case. OK, racism and violence are uh, not necessarily interconnected. So just talk to us about excessive force. As chief of police in Boca Raton for nine years, how often did you have to speak to your officers about the use of excessive force? Uh, we, we trained on excessive force and actually regular force, and including uh, discussing excessive force, on an annual basis. And we always did an analysis of all the use of force incidents that occurred. And as a result of that analysis, we either increased uh, training or directed training in another way that we thought we saw some weaknesses. And mind you, there are law enforcement office agencies in the United States that are accredited. Boca Raton was one of them. And we were required by the accrediting body 
to annually assess our use of force, annually train our officers. And as a matter of fact, we trained our officers more than just annually. It was every uh, six months we would train in use of force, the laws apply applying to use of force, and of course, not to use excessive force relative to any individual that you come and you encounter with. You only have to use that force that is necessary to stop the violence or to arrest an individual. So it was frequent that we, we trained our officers on use of force protocols. Why is there so much excessive violence and so much killing of unarmed black men in the United States? Uh, the African-American population makes up 13.4% of the population in the country, and yet 23.4% of fatal police shootings. Uh, black Americans are the victims of those. What possibly explains so many killings by law enforcement of unarmed black Americans? If I had the answer, I would be uh, having the wealth of Bill Gates. Um, one can conjecture that there's racism involved. One can also conjecture, conjecture that the acts of the individual prompted the law enforcement officer to engage in that type of deadly force. But in between those two answers, there's got to be a, a, the truth. And that truth is hard to come by with all the data and the statistics that we have. I cannot understand specifically why a certain percentage of our population winds up either being subjected to deadly force higher than the percentage of the population, or that that population, the black population, African-American population, represents about 28 to 30 percent of those individuals incarcerated. So you have a smaller population that is either subjected to deadly force more so than other segments of the population, as well as incarceration. On the face of it, one might suggest that there is a racist bias within the criminal justice system. And to some extent, there may be validity to that based on the numbers that we're just talking about. I don't have the specific answers as to why that is occurring. And it's too easy to say that we're racist and therefore we apply our laws unjustly to minorities. I just, I, 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 can't, I, I can't accept that, but the numbers do tell a certain tale that needs to be ferreted out even further. Yeah, uh, certainly, Andrew. You know, I mean, obviously, I should clarify that the 23.4% of fatal shootings by ethnicity, which pertain to the victims being African-American, that's not always the case that they're unarmed African-Americans. It's just a complete total, according to the statistics that are available. But, of course, it's the killing of unarmed black men that receives the most attention simply because the victim is unarmed. Andrew J. Scott, really appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you so much indeed for spending time with us.